Khazad Doom was the greatest city in all Middle Earth, then a dark mausoleum by the end of the Third Age. So, what is the history of Moria? Hi everyone, this is Robert. Welcome to In Deep Geek. On this channel we do breakdowns and explainers about Tolkien's world of the Lord of the Rings, as well as A Song of Ice and Fire, The Witcher and more. If you like the sound of that, there's a subscribe button in the bottom right of your screen. khazad was founded in the mists of Middle-earth time. Durin I awoke at Gundabad in the northern end of the Misty Mountains and made his way south, seeking somewhere to make a home. He ended at a lake in a valley halfway down the eastern side of the mountains. Looking into its reflection, he saw a crown of stars and took it for a sign that he should settle there. The lake was named the Miramir, and a stone pillar was placed where Durin had gazed into the lake, Durin's stone. Gimli makes a point of stopping by there during the Fellowship's escape from Moria much later, despite the threats of orcs descending on them soon. It's something of a holy spot for them. Durin and his clan set to excavating the caves above the lake, creating the Great Gates, the First Hall, and the Bridge of khazad at this early stage, it was all about defence and security. The gates were inscribed with runes keeping out anyone uninvited, and the whole point of the bridge of khazad you'll remember it from Gandalf facing down the Balrog there much later, was to prevent armies from rushing into the dwarves' new home. You could only go single file. But their security now assured, the dwarves delved deeper into the mountains. It became a homeland and a refuge, and increasingly a place of wonder. The halls and homes stretched for miles westwards, as well as upwards and down, mining into the depths of the mountain. This wasn't just carving out caverns and rudimentary homes. khazad was huge, bright, airy. Ingenious architecture brought daylight down into the depths of the mountain, and rich seams of metals brought wealth into the realm. As early as the First Age of Middle-earth, the stories of khazad wonders had travelled as far as the elves of Beleriand. Events in Beleriand in the First Age had an impact on khazad too. The devastation of that age destroyed the dwarven settlements of Nogrod and Belagost in the Blue Mountains, leading to a migration eastwards. The dwarves of the Blue Mountains brought with them great skills in crafting and smithing. khazad had an immigration fueled renaissance and hit the height of its power and wonder during the Second Age. At some point during this period, Tolkien doesn't tell us exactly when, the dwarves, delving ever deeper, discovered Mithril. It's hard to overstate the impact of this discovery. Mithril wasn't just a really cool metal, it was lighter and stronger than any other metal, so perfect for weapons of war, and also beautiful, and easily manipulated into even threads for decorations. It was the most astonishing natural discovery ever in Middle-earth, and it brought even more riches to khazad Celebrimbor and some fellow Noldorin elves settled just to the west of the Misty Mountains, simply to be closer to the dwarves of khazad and their Mithril. Another gate was built at the western end of the underground city this time, the West Gate, or Doors of Durin, like the great gates at the eastern edge of the city, these were magical. The Fellowship spends some time outside millennia later while Gandalf tries to figure out the password, but there is a crucial difference. The East Gate, where khazad started, is all about keeping people out, runes to prevent people from coming in. The West Gate, constructed after centuries of peace and once khazad was strong and respected, was all about letting friends in. The spell on the West Gate was not a protective one, it was one of welcome. All an elf had to do was to say they were a friend in their own language, and khazad was open to them. It's also worth just noting the scale of the city by this time. It extended for over 40 miles from east to west. At one point while traversing the city, Gandalf mentions that they are on the seventh level, so it had at least seven levels of depth as well, and probably mines going even deeper, and definitely stairs going right to the summit of the mountain. And it wasn't just in one straight line, it extended to the north and south too. This was massive, complex and three-dimensional. It was universally recognised as the greatest city in all Middle-earth. 
For a time, the dwarves and the elves outside lived there not just in peace and prosperity, but also in great friendship. They shared a love of crafting and smithing. They shared raw materials and technologies. The elves of Oregion developed an alloy with Mithril that they called Ithildin, Star Moon, that made it visible only by moon or starlight, and so on. But this all came to an end when Celebrimbor, the lord of Oregion, was taken in by Sauron, disguised as Anatar, making rings of power. We all know that story. It ended for the elves of Oregion with Sauron invading. The dwarves did help for a bit, but eventually had to shut the gates of Khazadum against Sauron. This ushered in the next phase of Khazadum's life. Engagement with the outside world was over. During the third, the king of the Longbeards at the time gained one of the seven rings of power that Sauron distributed to the dwarf lords, though dwarf tradition holds that he got it direct from Celebrimbor, and they delved deeper and more greedily. Though we don't have any records of this time, it was a long period of time, more than three and a half millennia in fact. Generation after generation after generation of dwarves lived and died in splendid isolation under the Misty Mountains. Khazadum no doubt got grander, its size ever-expanding, its wealth growing into a massive horde, one of the legendary Seven Dwarf Hordes, and surely the most glorious. Then, in the year 1980 of the Third Age, tragedy. The dwarves kept mining and digging deeper, seeking more riches and more mithril, and deep, deep under Khazadum, they awoke a balrog. Now, if you'll forgive a little personal commentary on this, the traditional narrative is that the dwarves dug too greedily, and that is what is to blame for the Balrog being awoken. I think that's a little unfair. By this point, the dwarves have been mining in those mountains for at least 6,000 years, and probably much longer. It's what they did, it's who they were. They had been mining there for time immemorial, and they weren't to know that there was a nameless terror hiding down there. I don't think we can blame the dwarves for that. Anyway, the Balrog, who had hidden there at the end of the First Age after Morgoth's defeat, was roused. And if we ever doubted how powerful the Maiar are compared to normal mortals, then this should end all debate. One Balrog completely destroyed and emptied the greatest city ever built. Their king, during the Sixth, was slain, giving the nameless horror a name, Durin's Bane. The dwarves were scattered, Khazadum was abandoned, it fell dark and desolate. For half a millennium, the Balrog was its only inhabitant, and it gained a new name, Moria, which means dark pit. Then the orcs began to seep into Moria. Soon they were everywhere in the upper levels, leaving the Balrog to live in the depths. Sauron eagerly desired Mithril, so they sent that to him, but many soon started worshipping the Balrog as a god. And so it remained for a few hundred years. The dwarves, of course, did not take that lying down. This was their homeland. So we have the War of the Dwarves and Orcs. That started when Azog, the chieftain of the Orcs of Moria, captured, killed and mutilated Thror, the king of Durin's folk. Azog carved his name into Thror's severed head and threw it down for all to see, and the dwarves took that personally. The battle that followed in the year 2799, outside Moria's East Gate, was a victory for the dwarves. They had driven the orcs from most of Moria. Azog had been decapitated, but their own forces had also paid a hefty price. When Durin's bane was spotted waiting just inside the East Gate, it was enough for most of them to accept that they could not retake Khazadum. So Khazadum was left to Durin's bane for another couple of hundred years. Gandalf managed to cross it during this period, as did Aragorn a bit later, but it was a grim and dark place, and the Balrog was lurking in the deep somewhere. There was one more effort to retake the Longbeard's homeland, led by Balin. You'll remember him from The Hobbit. Half a century or so after the quest of Erebor and the dwarves reclaiming their home in the Lonely Mountain, Balin led a contingent of dwarves in an attempt to retake Khazadum. It was doomed to failure. They had some immediate success, but eventually the sheer weight of orcs there weighed against them. When the Fellowship later passed through Moria, they see Balin's tomb and read about the drums in the deep, and then the orcs swarm them, to be followed by the Balrog. 
The confrontation between the Belrog and Gandalf happens mostly off-screen. We just see the first exchanges before they both plunge into the depths. To be fair to Gandalf, he was right. That foe was far beyond all of the other's skills. He basically took one for the team, allowing them to carry on. Gandalf and the Balrog were basically equal opponents, and though their fight took days, at the end they both died. Gandalf obviously came back, because Uru Iluvatar, the one god of Tolkien's world, had his back, but the overall result was that there was now no Balrog in Moria. So when the War of the Ring ended, and the orcs were also diminished, that left khazad largely undefended. And sure enough, Durin the Seventh led the Longbeards back into khazad in the second century of the Fourth Age. Tolkien tells us that they remained there until the world grew old and the dwarves failed and the days of Durin's race were ended. khazad was the greatest city known in Middle-earth, and it took the power and might of a Balrog to throw them from it. But finally, eventually, they did retake it and lived in peace for many years. But much like the beginning of Moria, its end is lost in the mists of time. Such is the way with myth. But I think Tolkien wanted us to know that the end of the story for the dwarves was a happy one. They may have been victims first of the elves' genocidal tendencies, and then the Balrog and Smaug and overwhelming numbers of orcs throwing them from their homeland, but in the end, the dwarves prevailed. They reclaimed their homeland. They could once more mine and craft and be who they were meant to be. And they could do it in khazad the greatest and most wonderful of their homelands. If you'd like to watch more videos about The Lord of the Rings or the wider world of Tolkien's Middle-earth, please click on the link on the left of your screen. Or if you'd like to support this channel, the best way to do that is by clicking on the Patreon link on the right of your screen. That's all for this time. Thanks for watching. I'll see you again soon.